The 11-day session has come to an end, but the efforts in promoting social and economic development continue. China's top political advisor Wang Yang reviews the work of the CPPCC Standing Committee. All CPPCC members have carried out in-depth discussions on the government's work report and other important documents of the two sessions. They gave insightful advice and reached fruitful results. During this session, the advisory body submitted more than 5,000 proposals addressing the most pressing issues for China's development. Major topics include fighting the three battles of preventing major risks, alleviating poverty and controlling pollution. They also covered maintaining healthy economic development and improving people's livelihood. We should further optimize the socialist system with Chinese characteristics and promote the modernization of the national governance system. We should further carry out reforms to improve our consultative body's functions and develop a mature system for a democratic consultative system. The end of the CPPCC annual session doesn't mean the work is over for its members. Actually, it means another new start for them to help promote the shit political belief, as well as contributing more wisdom towards building a nation of greater openness and prosperity. China wants a stable money supply for the economy on fiscal steroids. It aims to prevent cash squeeze in the market when business activity rises. The downward trend of social financing has been tamed. Now, given China's current economic situation, there's still room for reserve requirement retail cut, but the room is much smaller than in previous years. Overall, the prudent monetary policy tone hasn't changed. We will take a market-oriented approach when it comes to managing interest rates and use supply-side reform to reduce the risk of lending among small companies to drag down the overall cost of financing in China. The PBOC has been managing the expectations. It's been telling the market that it cares about jobs and inflation, but not so much about economic stimulus. That gives more room for the fiscal stimulus here because tax cuts and government spending have a more direct impact on the economy. And there will unlikely be a flood of monetary easing like a decade ago. The central bank has dropped the neutrality of policy to pursue a prudent approach. That leads China to pursue longer debt maturities and long-term bank lending. But if the economy grows slower than expected in the next few quarters, there will be temporary cash reliefs for the market. This is actually a compromise um, because using short-term liquidity boost, it can quickly turn into inflation problem and doesn't really have a good money multiplier effect. Um, so by issuing those long-term bond, it can potentially um, support some of the longer-term infrastructure, for example, project, which can span over several years or even a decade. China's A shares have seen wild rallies this year, and the bond market is showing rising asset bubble risk. So when will be a good time for the central bank to take actions? Uh, in the first half of the year, I don't see much of the uh, rate cuts happening, um, precisely because the stock market risk is rising. Um, but around October, uh, especially when it's entering the last quarter, I can see that uh, there might be a lack of momentum because the tax cut, uh, the effect will take about a year to really emerge. Then we might see more of a stimulus then. Meanwhile, the U.S. Fed has decided not to raise interest rates this year as aggressively as before. That takes off some pressure on the Chinese yuan currency. The big uncertainty, though, is Europe, as the ECB lowers the 2019 and 2020 Eurozone growth forecasts. So we will continue to see a monetary easing in Europe, and that can potentially put some uh, pressure on China uh, in terms of capital outflow. But since we're putting stronger control now, mm, I do not see it has too much impact on China either. As China prioritizes financial risk control, bank lending will remain the primary source of funding and credit for the economy. That's why analysts expect to see more banks issue perpetual bonds or debt without maturity dates to boost their long-term capital. Another big move towards opening up China's financial market. In the past, foreign rating agencies had to work with Chinese partners as joint ventures, and now they're permitted to compete on equal footing with Chinese domestic companies. Standard & Poor's Global Ratings becomes the very first of the major global rating agencies to win approval for a fully foreign-owned business in China. The financial regulators in China have long had a thoughtful approach to the development 
of China's financial markets. The approval of S&P Global Ratings entry to the credit rating markets is the latest step in China's commitment and strategy to further open up its markets. China's financial market has seen tremendous growth over the past decade. Its bond market has become the third largest worldwide, with an aggregate balance exceeding 12.5 trillion U.S. dollars. S&P Global Ratings see lucrative opportunities in this market and is preparing extensively to start the rating business. Under the regulatory approval, we are permitted to rate financial institutions, corporates, structured finance, and panda bonds in the interbank bond markets. We are prepared and ready to issue ratings to Chinese corporates in the near future. China's central bank says allowing global raters independently into the market is of great importance. It says it will help to meet the needs of international investors in diversifying yuan-denominated assets and improve the quality of China's rating industry. And for standard ports, they are confident they will win a row in this market. We are known for providing independent, transparent credit ratings around the world. The market participants, the regulators know what we stand for. We are confident with our experience and reputation, we will be successful in this market. For many tourists, a gift shop is an inevitable stop. But one of China's top sites, the Palace Museum, has one that really stands out. The exquisite shop is just outside the Forbidden City's walls. Thousands of creative cultural items, such as tags, stickers, and hats, bring traditional cultural heritage closer to the younger generation. It's a sensation for young people. I came all the way from Shanghai to buy stickers and fridge magnets for myself and friends. They sold out very, very quickly. Since 2016, the museum's cultural products have caused quite a buzz on social networks, brought in online sales, and generated big financial success. Sales of Palace Museum merchandise now exceeds 1.5 billion yuan. The museum designs cute souvenirs to attract more visitors to take home the culture of the Palace Museum. These items make a nation culture more accessible to the general public. Cultural consumption is expanding almost every industry in China. Take movies as an example. China's homemade sci-fi thriller Wandering Earth raked in $550 million, becoming the highest grossing IMAX release ever nationwide. There are so many movies in theaters during the holidays, and I came with friends today to watch Crazy Alien. With the government coupons, I go to the theater every two weeks. It's like a happy now. China is now the world's second largest movie market, and experts estimate it will overtake the U.S. and become the largest by 2020. According to the 2018 China Cultural Consumption Index released by Renmin University in Beijing, the five most popular cultural products among Chinese consumers are television and radio, online cultural activities, movies, books, and cultural tourism. While the country's cultural industries are enjoying a rapid growth, it is estimated that China's cultural consumption could reach 4.7 trillion yuan. That's just shy of 600 billion U.S. dollars. Currently, the consumption figures are just about a quarter of that. It may take years to bridge the gap, but how that can be achieved is the crucial question. As of right now, every year more than 15,000 episodes of TV dramas are produced in China, but less than half of them end up on the market. Low-level competitions and homogenization are still crippling the cultural industries. More government support for enterprises will help them create high-quality products. China plans to develop its cultural industry into a pillar of the national economy by 2020. It also aims to create cultural enterprise groups that can compete globally. Professor Xiao says these goals are ambitious and achievable if both the supply and demand side are supported. And more importantly, consumption will remain robust if the broader economy stays strong.